Welcome to Design Thinking Games, a fantasy and user experience podcast. Each episode, your podcast hosts, Tim Broadwater and Michael Schofield, will examine the player experience of board games, pen and paper role playing games, live action games, mobile games, and video games. You can find every episode, including this one, on your podcatcher of choice and on the web at designthinkinggames.com. Alternate history. Historic fiction? Kind of the what if, you know, scenario, um, a branch off of history. I know this has become a very popular genre in gaming. And I know that we've talked about things like Mortal Engines or Savage Frontier or Man in the High Castle or, you know, Hunters. And so just want to kind of pick your brain about what are your thoughts about that genre? And I don't even know if the name is correct. I think it's also referred to as alt history, like alternate history, alternative history, um, alt hist, A-H, but it's also sometimes called speculative fiction. Um, I think Steam, like not Steamworks, but um, Steampunk is generally kind of this in general. So anything that's Steampunk is is kind of in this genre or subgenre per se. Um, but taking it back to games, the ones that stand out to me the most, the ones that are the most memorable um, to me are Bioshock. This is 1920s and, you know, People are dancing to Charleston, and then there are flappers, and there's bathtub gin, and like, you got the moxie, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you know, uh, what I love about Bioshock is that it's like, okay, in that time period, um, when you think of like uh, the the money in the United States, so to speak, if you think of like the Fords and the Carnegies and the people like who are kind of like molding it or like Atlas Shrugged to even some degree is kind of this, right? Um, that there's this person who kind of separates himself from contemporary society and builds like an underwater um, city and, and that's in Bioshock and you're kind of exploring it as someone who's like whose plane has crashed or a boat has crashed or whatever, and you kind of happened upon it in the ocean, and you kind of see that there's, oh, wow, this is literally like, you know, the Roaring Twenties, but in an underwater city. And then the offshoot there is how it impacts history and then how um, science fiction kind of plays into where it offshoots in different ways to where um, they figured out ways to make people into... Um, these kind of big daddies, which are the the kind of mind slave robots, you know what I mean? And they take children and they turn them into the little s sisters, and 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 what those two do, and how they collect. Um, I think it's called Adam, or or like the thing that they collect, and it gives people powers, and then people have powers where they can levitate objects, or they can shoot fire from their hands and whatever. And then of course it leads to like crazy destruction and um, and carnage and the city kind of collapses. But what I like about, and I'm spoil, hopefully that's not a spoiler for anyone, but what I like about the Bioshock games and one, two, and three, three being kind of the same thing, but it happens, it's a floating city, you know, that's kind of, but at the same time period, to me, I think those are phenomenal games that really capture that period or piece of time, you know, kind of historically, but then propose this um, different outcome than what you would think historically, you know? Yeah, so Bioshock is a really good example because it's not only like set in this time, right? But it is um, specifically Randian, right? In terms of Ayn Randian, that's to, that's to your point. And it gives you an opportunity to um, put yourself in the shoes of kind of like an Ayn Rand-like character. Uh, the, the chief antagonist of Bioshock is Andrew Ryan, I believe. And the notion is that, hey, the world is full of moochers, um, uh, I don't know that they would say the world is full of socialists, but, you know, those who are listening now certainly can appreciate <laughs> the um, the 
that kind of that line of thinking, whether or not they agree with it or hear it in everyday discourse anyway. So it's something that we are still debating to this day. But at this point, Andrew Ryan's idea is like, hey, the, the way that society uh, in the United States at this time or uh, is trending is at odds with personal freedom. And so he, with his great wealth and with uh, the combined um, efforts of like a select class of people go and create rapture that is, you know, out like in international waters under the ocean, etc. Mm-hmm. And so it's both, you know, it, it takes a place of this kind of like, I, I think it's supposed to be like forties era. Um, and you are able to kind of like really enjoy sort of the uh, to sort of like the pop culture novelty of that time frame. But it also really grounds you in this mode of thinking, this philosophy, which, you know, is part and parcel of Ayn Rand's objectivism, you know, Ayn Rand, who wrote like Atlas Shrugged. And it get, lets you explore how good of a philosophy that is when put to practice um and that's i think kind of like the the appeal Uh, there's there's two sides right a is like you get to like experience the time but b you really get to question that like what if scenario i like when i'm thinking about like novels i think of um like a man in the high castle like what happens if the nazis won world war ii this kind of situation where it's really interesting to explore and because and you explore because it reveals something about yourself or your society. In mm-hmm. this case, you know, Bioshock, you know, for, for good or ill, um, is telling basically a story about like unchecked capitalism and, uh, and selfishness. Uh, 100%. I, I agree. Right? And I think most people, th- yeah, I think most alt hist or like this kind of, um, whatever we want to call it. Alt hist is just, I'm just saying that because it seems, you know, a lot shorter than like spec fic or like speculative fiction or whatever. But I mean, it does seem to be very much around the industrial revolution, right? It seems to be like when you think of other things, like apart from Bioshock, uh, you think of like, let's say the Rocketeer. Rocket Ranger being, you know, the kind of the game, but the Rocketeer, which I think, it, but it's the kind of the same thing to where that time period where it's like, you know, if if one man had a jetpack, you know, <laughs> and he's a superhero, but it is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, how would it change things, you know, when you are kind of talking about, uh, I'm not sure of the time period, if it was the 20s, 30s, or 40s. Um, Yeah, I think it was post-World War I, right? I think, well, actually, I think it's, it may be pre, but to that point, it's very industrial revolution. Like, a lot of these alt-hist games seem to center around either the industrial revolution, or they seem, in my opinion, or from what I've seen, they seem to center around wars, like WW2. Um, WW1, you know, uh, things of that nature. And so when you look at things that are like uh, Freedom Fighters or um, Bioshock, uh, you know, I don't know if you find that to be true, but a lot of it seems to be um, around wars that I see. So so I have um, uh, I have a theory, uh, like a possible explanation um, for that. so, so, you know, cut all this out if you want, <laughs> but no, no. What do you think? I'm curious because I'm not gravitate. I don't. So by yeah, default, man. I don't gravitate to that genre because I don't like war fighting. Game. I will play, I'll shoot a gun and run around to some degree, but I am not a call of duty person. I am not an Assassin's Creed kind of person. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, and I know that those are phenomenal games that people play. Well, look at, look at something like, um, like, uh, well, hold on. Let me let, let, let's rewind for a minute. The there there's a alternate timeline where I end up as um, an English professor, right, at some university. Um, this was my track originally, um, and and uh, and before I went into grad school to pr- pursue kind of like information studies, I was looking hard at getting like a master's and. Um, literature or pursuing a PhD. 
So as part of like the um, the honors program that I was in in my undergrad as an English major, I focused on the basically the commonalities between Victorian literature and far future science fiction. Um, and I have a point here. So one of the reasons that um, those two intersect or like are right. intermingled. So, so, so one of one of the thinking here is that um, if we just take sort of like the Victorian period, let's call it eighteen um, sixties through like maybe up to like the modernist part. So, which would be like nineteen twelve, nineteen thirteen, something like that. Uh, from from you know Queen Victoria up unto World War One, and World War One plays a role in here. But like if we if we just take that period just out of context. There are a few things that we can say are true. Um, one being that we have a really good grasp of the history of that time. It was a period of, compared to previous times, high literacy, right? And while there was a high degree of complexity in the the the, the growth and fall of empire, wars, etc., much of it was written down in a way that we have never had prior. So we can look back at this time with a good degree of clarity, appreciate and even identify moments that are catalysts, right? Like uh, the assassination of uh, Franz Duke Ferdinand, right? Um, that arguably started World War I. Would, would, would the war have started without that assassination? Probably. Um, but it started a little earlier because of that. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have, we are able to like identify these kinds of moments. Now, one of the things that's really true about this period, um, in addition is that because of industrial revolution, this was a time where your relationship to, I don't know, God or the cosmos was really in question no longer did you need to have, you know, a whole bunch of Tims um, on a, on a factory line when you had a machine that could do what many people could like had to had to before. Right. You know, we have um, we have this idea of like man's place in the world and machines place in the world and man's relationship to machine. Mm -hmm. These are all things man's relationship to God. There's a huge like like there's a strong like atheist movement um in the victorian period that again is just kind of like unparalleled before that you really like in the you really have this um world where some degree of like supernatural was just a given never questioned so the victorian period is just this huge place of or a huge time of well chronicled complex events exacerbated by all new technologies that just totally changed the world left and right all the time. And the, the struggles individuals had, especially individual, like the, the individuals who ha happened to write, right? Like the, the, the artists and the, and the novelists and the poets and stuff like that, um, are really struggling with their sense of self. When we look at something like, um, science fiction, we are really kind of like addressing a lot of the same issues, right? So like now when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're still having these questions about like, like our place in a machine world, whether we become like, is artificial intelligence something that augments us? Where does humanity end? Um, you know, like things of this sort, right? We were the, the, the far future, you know, content that we create is exploring the exactly the same kinds of things as, you know, this sort of like Victorian period. And in fact, you know, there's a reason that Jules Verne like appears like in this time, all that to say is that like, so like the, the cool thing about like speculative alternate history, where it's not just you're going back into time, but like, let's say you're going back into like world war one or something like that pre or just after it's, 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 it's a, it's a situation that you really can understand because it's so chronicled. You can put, you can put a character or put a player in a pivotal moment because you can identify those pivotal moments. And then if you sprinkle in, little changes like the, you know, there's a world where steam, uh, steam power really does dominate, um, mm -hmm. and, and 
change the course of the history. And then we, then we can really explore what those kinds of things are. But it's all to this point where, you know, like with something like Bioshock or shit, even like, a, you know, Assassin's Creed or, you know, the Rocketeer or something like that, where it's really questioning like um, the, you know, the role of humanity in this super changing thing. No, I agree. I think what you see in Rocketeer is like, okay, does science ever go too far? Does capitalism ever go too far? Does robotics ever go too far? And what what point robotics do we Robotics is a great one. They kind of use like the humanity piece, you know, and and uh, what the one that occurs to me here, even though it's a soft, I would say alt hist or um uh, you know, kind of uh speculative fiction is and the, and this is probably as military as I go or like war game as I go is I love Metal Gear and Metal Gear Solid and oh, and yeah. Metal yeah and Metal Gear is completely based on an alternate history where the Cold War doesn't end you know after the 1970s 1980s but continues right into the 90s and so the first one which is the Nintendo one where it's all kind of above you know kind of view um you're Solid Snake, you're this rookie member of this group called Foxhound, and then you are sent into where they find this weapon of mass destruction, you know, kind of in this place in South Africa, you know. And then with Metal Gear Solid, um, I think it becomes a little bit more pronounced because it's the same premise to where it's alternate history, Cold War, it keeps going, like it's never ended. Um, like Nazis are not, I don't know. I can't think of the name of it, but it's like, there's one piece of like, there's a movie where like Nazis live on the moon or Nazis are zombies in Switzerland still and, or, or whatever. But I mean, along that line, um, you're kind of sent into these kind of scenarios or these kind of remote locations, you know, kind of to do as a special, um, forces or spec ops kind of person. And, um, you kind of uncover like, Oh, you know, I'm fighting a boss like Psycho Mantis, which I'm not sure if you've played Metal Gear Solid, have you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Psycho Mantis is this, oh, I'm like a from German and Russian kind of uh, experimentation. I've learned how to weaponize psychic powers, and now I'm <laughs> in working with, you know, the armed forces or, or whatever with that. And um, even though that's not... Um, alternate history per se I, I would say it kind of lends a little bit enough from it it's kind of like what I would say is like what Michael Crichton does like a lot in his writings oh, sure. like Michael Crichton literally is a doctor who quit being an ER doctor and he actually made the show ER uh, you know uh, but all of his stuff is kind of all of his fiction is always grounded in a little bit of science and history right and so that's why there's so much of that plausible. It seems plausible what they do in Jurassic Park because it's like, well, if we could get the DNA and we can clone, you know what I mean? How do we, uh, it could happen, you know? So it's yeah. like that science fiction versus, um, I guess, what you would call speculative fiction. Well, I think, yeah, I think the idea of a speculative is just, you know, what if, right? The, the Your point about like war before, it didn't occur to me, but like, yeah, um, Nazi zombies is a, a great example because in World War II, the Nazis were exploring all sorts of things. One of the reasons that we have Indiana Jones is because the Nazis were really interested in the occult. So in that kind of like scenario, the question, the question that Indiana Jones poses is what if the Nazis found the Ark of the Covenant, right? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sounds the, like ridiculous, but dead it's snow. Like, if I don't know if you've seen dead the Norwegian snow, which is like a it's it's, it's actually great, Nazi zombies, right? Yeah, it's yeah, a Norwegian it's like, horror film from like the mid two thousands, and um, and it's you know, uh, Nazis went to um, Norway, I think what it is, and then like they were looking for this occult relic right which reanimates them after death you know so it kind of uh definitely like science fiction speculative fiction well and, and it's that whole thing where um you know 
just uh, I, I feel like we should just say that uh, the the big Nazi what if you know being Wolfenstein 3D <laughs> like back in the day when you know one of the first um, first person shooters um, where you have to go like fight like Mecha Hitler. You have to. You're escaping from a prison or a concentration camp. I thought Castle Wolfenstein. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're BJ Blastowitz, Blastowitz, or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 you know the, the the Nazis are a really good. Um, yeah, Iron Sky is the movie I'm thinking of. Sorry, that is the one to where in the few the Nazis have left Earth because they've explored kind of space travel and rocket technology. And they've built, like, the Nazis are on the moon, and uh, they control the moon, you know? Well, the idea is that, like, yo, I mean, the reason that this is, like, lowercase p plausible is because, you know, in World War II, the Germans built the V-2 rocket. Like, had they won, had had the world changed a little bit, maybe they would have been the ones to ultimately, like, land on the moon, right? They're, they're... You know their interest. You know, you know they're really good fodder for speculative fiction. Not only because like we can look back at it, and because it's so well detailed, it's so well documented, and both in picture and film, not let, let alone writing, that mm-hmm. we can, you know, speculate um, yeah, what would have happened if they would have won. There's this interplay between like, and maybe this is kind of speaking to the larger, like stepping back, like what people want in games, right? Or what players want in games or the user thing, which is what is my balance between like, how real do I want this or how much fiction do I want? Or do do I want them to mingle together, right? And so I know that we started, we mentioned at the very beginning, Savage Frontier. I've never played the role-playing game, like the tabletop role-playing game, but I played the old school computer game, Savage Frontier. And to me, like, it was so amazing that, you know, like, these people from, I would say, latter 1800s Britain um, or the UK, like, go into a place to where dinos- it's a jungle tribal dinosaurs still exist, but they can, uh, they understand firearms and, you know, they actually understand how medicine works and how to make gunpowder and things like that so it's like when those two things kind of meet land of the lost you know yes, kind of savage exactly. frontier like how does it play out and that's kind of exciting you know for well, players I think that, yeah i guess the question is is like you know um what do you as a player get out of like exploring a scenario right like like what is what is your takeaway like so maybe you sit down to play like a game of battlefield Uh, And you just run and gun because it is ultimately like a stress reliever. Right. Um, But there's something about like, um, you know, dipping your toes into. Like, you know, like something like Bioshock is a great one. Bioshock probably spawned as as many like objectivists as it did um, otherwise, because it lets you really explore philosophies and um mo just other modes of thinking in a mm-hmm. really like let's be honest in the, in the safe environment of your bedroom on your couch or in your chair like with some headphones right safer even than maybe just like reading like reading a book <laughs> right because it's in the context of a game as opposed to you know the danger of actually picking up like like a manifesto and reading propaganda that's truly trying to change your mind in the in the game speculative like you know it's fiction in the same way of like reading reading Jurassic Park or watching Jurassic Park or playing Jurassic Park Lego <laughs> or whatever you get to um, safely explore how you might act if you came face to face with one of those um like uh, like acid spitting dinosaurs that uh, take Newman from Seinfeld out, um, <laughs> or maybe you just want to uh, kill Mecha Hitler. Thank you for listening to the Design Thinking Games podcast. To connect with your hosts Michael or Tim, please go to designthinkinggames.com, where you can request topics, ask questions, or see what else is going on. Until next time, game on.